Hello and welcome to Insight of Thermology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to another lecture. Today's quest is on the nerve supply to the lacrimal gland. On this journey, we shall also be finding an answer to this question. And the question is, which of the following is not a component of the parasympathetic supply to lacrimal gland? Is it superior salivatory nucleus, inferior salivatory nucleus, pterygoparatine ganglion, geniculate ganglion? So join this journey of the nerve supply of the lacrimal gland and by the end of the video, you shall find the answers. So the nerve supply of the lacrimal gland, we shall be studying about the sensory nerve supply, the parasympathetic nerve supply and the sympathetic nerve supply of the lacrimal gland. First, let us start with the sensory nerve supply. To understand that, you should know that we have a trigeminal nerve, which is the fifth cranial nerve and it has about three parts. The first division is the ophthalmic division, which actually enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. Then we have the V2, that is the maxillary division, which basically enters the foramen rotundum. Then we have the mandibular division, which enters through the foramen ovale. To understand the sensory nerve supply, you have to basically focus upon the ophthalmic division which is represented by V1 over here and the main nerve which supplies the sensory innovation to the lacrimal gland is a lacrimal nerve. And here I would like you to, to observe another nerve which is drawn in blue color representing that it is coming from the second division of the, max, of the trigeminal nerve and this is the maxillary division and the nerve is the zygomatic nerve. So, the lacrimal nerve basically is the smallest branch of the V1, that's the ophthalmic division. It basically comes out of the lateral compartment of the superior orbital fissure and then it enters the orbit and finally supplies the lacrimal gland. What is important over here is to note the connection between the lacrimal nerve and the zygomatic nerve. Okay, and this connection can sometimes be between the zygomatic nerve and the lacrimal nerve. And sometimes it can also be present between the zygomatic or temporal branch and the lacrimal nerve. What you should notice over here is that the zygomatic and the zygomatic or temporal branches are basically the branches of the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. Now, this becomes very important because the lacrimal nerve as such, as I told you, it is, is responsible for the sensory supply of the lacrimal gland. However, because it has a connection with the zygomatic or the zygomatic temporal branches of the V2 or the maxillary division, it will somehow also receive the parasympathetic and the sympathetic supply from there and therefore our lacrimal nerve will become the final pathway which will supply all the three innovations, whether it is sensory, whether it is parasympathetic or it is sympathetic. So now let us talk about the parasympathetic nerve supply and we shall actually be deep diving into this. So to understand that, let us go back to our basic and we need to understand largely the seventh nerve, which is the facial nerve. Now, this is our brainstem. We have a midbrain, pons and the medulla in the brainstem. And we all know that the seventh nerve basically arises from the pons of the brainstem. In the pons, we also have an origin of another uh, cranial nerve, which is the abducens nerve, which is the sixth cranial nerve. So basically, the motor part of the facial nerve, that is the seventh cranial nerve, actually rounds about the sixth cranial nerve and comes out like this. Okay, so the red color which I've drawn over there is the motor nucleus. Now, just beside that motor nucleus, drawn in purple color here is the superior salivatory nucleus. Then adjacent to that, we have another nucleus, which is the nucleus tractus solitarius. Now, these three nuclei are basically associated with the seventh nerve. However, in any anatomy lecture that you hear, you will also study about another associated nucleus, which is the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Now, the spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve, as the name suggests, it is actually from the trigeminal uh, it is associated with the trigeminal nerve and not with the seventh nerve. However, the innervation to this nucleus actually comes via the seventh nerve and that is why this nucleus is usually studied along with the other nuclei of the seventh nerve. 
Now, this is another cross section which is showing you all the nuclei, right? So we have the adjacent nucleus. Then around that, we have the motor nucleus of the facial nerve uh, from which the motor fibers will come out and they actually form a facial colliculus. Then we have the salivatory nucleus, which is drawn in purple color. Then we have the nucleus of tractus solitarius, which is drawn in green color. And then we have the spinal nucleus tract of the trigeminal nerve. So now let us understand e each of these nucleus individually. So the facial nerve, first of all, is a mixed cranial nerve. That means it has both the sensory as well as the motor components. The motor supply from the facial nerve basically goes to all the muscles which are derived from the second brachial arch, right? So these are basically the muscles of the facial expression and also the muscles associated with the elevation of the hyoid bone, right? So these are called the brachial efferent fibers, okay? And they will come from your motor nucleus over here, which I've drawn in the red color. Now, another efferent or the motor component is the component which is, go which is going to go to your various glands so here we have our lacrimal gland the submandibular gland sublingual gland palatine and also the nasal gland and this component is basically the secretory component and the secretory component is also called the parasympathetic component which is very important for the purpose of this video and this component is also called the general visceral efferents okay which is abbreviated as gve and this is the superior salivatory nucleus which is drawn in the purple color which is associated with the parasympathetic supply or the secretory supply to all these glands apart from that we have drawn in the green color the nucleus tractus solitarius and from here we will get basically the afferent supply and to be more specific, it is actually the sensations from the anterior two thirds of the tongue and the palate. And these sensations are then finally going to come basically to this nucleus over here, which is the nucleus tractus solitarius. And because it is dealing with some special sensation, the sensation of taste, this is called special visceral afferents, okay, abbreviated as SVA. The fourth component, again, an afferent component or a sensory component, right? So the previous one, which was carrying the sensation of taste was also a sensory component. And one more sensory component, which is actually being carried from the facial nerve, but relaying in the trigeminal nucleus, which is the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal drawn in gray color here is the fibers carrying the touch, pain, pressure sensation and these are coming basically from your external ear right and since they carry these general sensations from the ear they are called general visceral afferents so i hope that is clear so the first two basically are your efferents okay the red one is a motor motor component which is going to go and supply your muscles the second efferent is the one which is associated with the parasympathetic nerve supply the third one, which is in green color, is basically an afferent. That means it is a sensory nucleus associated with the taste. And the fourth one is also a sensory nucleus, which is associated with the touch, pain and pressure. So that is something that you, should, you must remember. So here, for the purpose of this video, we shall be focusing on this purple component, which is the secretory or the parasympathetic supply, which is going to the various glands in the head and neck. And here we are focusing on the lacrimal gland and therefore this general visceral efferent fibers or the secretory fibers or the parasympathetic fibers, which are coming basically from your salivatory nucleus. And to be more specific, it is coming from the superior salivatory nucleus are actually of importance to us. Now here, I would like to ask you one more question. So I am talking about the superior salivatory nucleus. But the question is, we also have an, an inferior salivatory nucleus. And the question is, with which cranial nerve is this inferior salivatory nucleus associated? So if you know the answer, come, give the answer in the comment section. So now let us talk about the superior salivatory nucleus. It's very important to actually understand this. The superior salivatory nucleus actually has two parts. The upper part, which is more important for us, is because the upper part basically supplies the parasympathetic nerve supply to the lacrimal gland. And since this upper part supplies the lacrimal gland, it is also called the lacrimatory 
nucleus. The lower part basically is associated with the parasympathetic supply or the secretory supply to the other salivary glands. But you must remember the upper salivatory nucleus or uh, the upper part of the superior salivatory nucleus which is called the lacrimatory nucleus. Now, as I told you that the red color which is coming from the motor nucleus forms basically the motor rule and for some reason the other three components are labeled as the sensory root. However, this is a misnomer. Why? Because I told you that the sensations which are coming uh, in this green and the gray part, that means the ones which are reaching the nucleus tractus solitarius and the trigeminal uh, spinal nucleus are definitely the sensory, sensory ones. However, the one which is coming out from the superior salivatory nucleus is actually a motor component which is supplying the secretory or the parasympathetic supply, right? So this is actually a misnomer because this sensory root does not just carry the sensory component, it also has one motor component or the parasympathetic component. Therefore, an appropriate word to use for this root would be actually nervous intermedius. The nervous intermedius is a collection of fibers which are coming from the superior salivatory nucleus, nucleus tractus solitarius and the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Now let us go ahead and understand the course of the facial nerve, specifically only the parasympathetic part. There we have the pons and pons is giving rise to the facial nerve. So the facial nerve on both the sides is actually going to enter an opening in the petrous part of the temporal bone and that opening you know here is called the internal acoustic meatus. Right? So through that internal acoustic meatus, the facial nerve is finally going to enter the inner ear and then enters the middle ear. Because we know that most of the component of the middle ear and the inner ear are actually present in the petrous part of the temporal bone and the facial nerve is finally entering that internal acoustic meatus and entering that petrous part of temporal bone and here there is one more nerve which tags along with it and that nerve is the vestibulocochlear nerve. Now from here, the facial nerve is actually going to reach the medial wall and to be more specific, the anterior part of the medial wall of the middle ear. So let me explain that to you. So consider this box to be actually your middle ear and the one that I've labeled here is actually the uh, projection by the promontory or the cochlear part. The yellow color wall is actually your medial wall. This labeled in green color is the anterior wall and the blue one is basically your posterior wall. Now, we know that the facial nerve will enter the internal acoustic meatus and then it is actually going to reach the middle ear and to be more specific, it basically reaches the anterior part of the medial wall of the middle ear right and from there it is going to actually enter into a bony canal which is present in this medial wall and finally it is going to pass along the posterior wall of the middle ear and this bony canal through which it actually travels is called the facial canal. Now on this path before it enters the middle ear it actually encounters a ganglion which I have drawn over here in green color and this ganglion is called the geniculate ganglion. Now let us understand this a uh, little bit in more detail. So basically first we'll look at the motor fibers. The motor fibers which are arising from the motor nucleus present in the pons as you see here are basically entering this internal acoustic meatus. As they travel through this internal acoustic meatus they are going to finally reach the anterior part of the medial wall of the middle ear. But on its way they are encountering the geniculate ganglia. Now here geniculate ganglion, they do not relay the geniculate ganglion, they just pass the geniculate ganglion and finally enter this bony facial canal which is present in the medial wall and in the posterior wall of your middle ear and finally coming out through a structure or through an opening over here which is located between the styloid process and the mastoid process. So this is your mastoid process. And here is the styloid process. So an opening which is present between the styloid and the mastoid process is called the stylomastoid foramina. Now as it comes out of the styloid mastoid foramina, before that it gives another branch and this branch basically goes and supplies another muscle here which is called the nerve to stapedius muscle. So that was regarding the motor component of the facial nerve which is 
not of that importance to us. Now, this geniculate ganglion basically is not a parasympathetic ganglion. This is something that you must remember. It is actually a sensory ganglion. Now, what happens in the parasympathetic system is that I already told you that we have a superior salivatory nucleus from which the parasympathetic supply to the lacrimal gland will basically originate. The upper part will send fibers to the lacrimal gland and the lower part will send fibers to the salivary glands. Now, however, both these parts will actually travel together. So this is how the motor root component basically travels. We have removed the uh, middle ear basically for the sake of clarity. And now let us look at the parasympathetic component which is coming from the superior salivatory nucleus. So this is how they are going to travel. So they are also going to travel through the geniculate ganglion. However, at the level of the geniculate ganglion and some books say that distal to the geniculate ganglion before these fibers enter the middle ear, what happens is that the part which is coming from the lacrimatory nucleus or the superior part of the salivatory nucleus will actually separate from this parasympathetic fibers and continue above as the greater petrosal nerve. So if someone asks you what is greater petrosal nerve, greater petrosal nerve is nothing but it is sort of a branch of the parasympathetic root of the facial nerve which has separated from the rest of the parasympathetic supply at the level of the geniculate ganglion. So now let us see what happens to this greater petrosal nerve. This is very very important. So this greater petrosal nerve actually enters your cranial cavity and as it enters the cranial cavity it basically encounters this lacerated foramen over here and this lacerated foramen is called the foramen lacerum right now as it enters this foramen lacerum again it encounters another opening out of the foramen lacerum and this opening is called the pterygoid canal okay clear till here next next what happens is that adjacent to the foramen lacerum we also have a carotid canal which is actually housing the internal carotid artery surrounding that internal carotid artery we have the nerve supply and to be more specific the sympathetic nerve supply which is coming from the superior cervical ganglion okay and they are actually going to form a nerve around this internal carotid artery and this nerve which is formed around the internal carotid artery is actually called the deep petrosal nerve so basically and uh, you already know what is a greater petrosal nerve. Greater petrosal nerve is an offshoot from the parasympathetic supply coming from the superior cervical ganglion, which has finally jumped into the foramen lacerum and now it's going to enter the pterygoid canal. At the same time, your internal carotid artery is actually carrying the sympathetic nerve supply surrounding it in the form of the deep petrosal nerve. Now this deep petrosal nerve is also going to enter your foramen lacerum and finally enter your pterygoid canal. Now, at the pterygoid canal, this greater petrosal and the deep petrosal are basically going to join together and they are going to form one single nerve and that single nerve is called nerve to pterygoid canal because they are traveling in the pterygoid canal and another name for that is the vidian nerve. Now let us see what happens to this video nerve. This video nerve basically now is going to enter another space, this triangular fossa, which is situated below the orbit above. And here we have the maxillary nerve, right? So a fossa which is formed by the orbit and the maxilla. And that fossa is called the pterygopalatine fossa. And in that pterygopalatine fossa, we have the main parasympathetic ganglion, which is called the pterygopalatine ganglion or the spinopalatine ganglion. So remember, your geniculate ganglion is not a parasympathetic ganglion. It is basically a sensory ganglion and therefore these fibers are not going to relay there. The fibers are actually going to come to this ganglion that you can see here or here for that matter, which is the spinopalatine ganglion or the pterygopalatine ganglion. So what happens is that your nerve to pterygoid canal or the vidian nerve will come at the spinopalatine ganglion and from the spinopalatine ganglion then you will have the post ganglionic parasympathetic fibers so till now whatever we discussed for the pre ganglionic parasympathetic fibers and now from the spinopalatine ganglion we will have the post ganglionic parasympathetic fibers and now they have to somehow reach your lacrimal gland to give that parasympathetic nerve supply 
and also they are carrying, remember, some part of the sympathetic nerve supply that came from the deep petrosal nerve. So let's see how that happens. So I told you in the beginning of the lecture, I hope you have not skipped that, that there is a connection between the lacrimal nerve and the zygomatic nerve. The lacrimal nerve coming from V1, that is the first division of the fifth, it is just a representation as V1. So basically V basically means the fifth cranial nerve and it's the first division and therefore that is why I'm calling it as basically V1. However, it would be more appropriate if you call it as the first division of the trigeminal nerve. So from the first division of the trigeminal nerve, which is the ophthalmic division, you get the lacrimal nerve. And from the maxillary division, you get the zygomatic nerve. And then you have a connection between the two. And the final common pathway is basically the lacrimal nerve supplying all the nerve supply. So this, these post-ganglionic fibers, basically they jump and they connect and supply whatever they have to the zygomatic nerve. And ultimately, the zygomatic nerve is going to connect to your lacrimal nerve and the lacrimal nerve is going to supply the lacrimal gland with the sympathetic, parasympathetic and also the sensory innovation. So let us quickly summarize. So we have the superior salivatory nucleus which is going to send the parasympathetic supply and enter the internal acoustic meatus along with the motor root of the facial nerve. These fibers are going to reach the geniculate ganglion situated above the middle ear. From there, it is going to take an offshoot and forms the greater petrosal nerve. These fibers of the greater petrosal nerve will jump into the foramen lacerum and from there enter the pterygoid canal. At the same time, they are going to be joined by the sympathetic fibers around the internal carotid artery, which are called the deep petrosal nerve. Together, they are going to form the nerve pterygoid canal or the vidian nerve, which are going to enter finally the pterygopalatine fossa and they are going to relay in the pterygopalatine ganglion. From the pterygopalatine ganglion, we have the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers, which are going to finally jump and join the second division, that is the maxillary division, basically through the zygomaticotemporal branch or the zygomatic nerve, which is going to send a twig to the lacrimal nerve and ultimately the lacrimal gland will receive the innervation. So that was about the nerve supply of the lacrimal gland now that we have completed the quest, let us revisit our question. By now, you might have already gotten an insight to the answer. And the answer to this question, that is which of the following is not a component of parasympathetic supply to lacrimal gland, is the inferior salivatory nucleus. Before I part, I would leave you with another question and that is with which cranial nerve is the lesser petrosal nerve associated? In the video, I talked about the deep petrosal nerve and the greater petrosal nerve. And now you shall find out about the lesser petrosal nerve. So do tell me your answers in the comment section. And one randomly chosen answer gets a shout out in the next video. So that was all for today. Thank you and have a nice day.